As Celine said, my name is Becca Stokes. I work with KWS Cereals as a livestock nutritionist. Um, and so just a little bit of history about KWS and hybrid rye before we jump right into the feeding side of things. Um, so KWS uh, is a family owned plant breeding company that was founded in the 1800s. And they've been breeding hybrid rye since the 1980s in Germany. Uh, but it's very new here in North America, and some of you probably maybe even haven't heard of hybrid rye yet. Um, we launched in Canada in 2014, so basically five years ago we launched in Canada, and this is our third year here in the U.S. So it's a very novel new crop, and I always encourage producers to think of it as a brand new crop, because this is not your grandfather's rye that he grew on the very sandy soils that had 30 bushels to the acre and was infested with ergot. So very different crop and all of a sudden we now have a new viable option for a feedstuff for livestock. And basically what's made this crop change so much is through the hybridity, through breeding, we've improved head size, we've improved yield, we improved standability, we improved tillering capacity, and all of these things that basically have improved this rye crop to take it from an open pollinated old style rye to a hybrid rye. Um, so some of the things that as breeders that the company of KWS is focused on, uh, the first and most important is yield. So this is a summary of the data from the University of Minnesota from five locations uh, from 2016 to 2018. These are two of our KWS hybrids. And these are some open pollinated conventional varieties of rye that would be available on the market. And this is, if you can see this number, that's 150 bushels to the acre. Um, so we are talking about a high yielding um, crop that basically puts a whole new spin on small grains and small grain profitability. Um, other things we focus on are ergot resistance, standability, reducing of lodging, and then abiotic stress. So winter survival, drought resistance, uh, excess moisture resistance. These are really the focuses of the breeding of hybrid rye. So why hybrid rye? Why should we include it into a rotation? I think one of the first and biggest takeaways is it has a lot of versatility. Um, it can be a grain crop. We have forage varieties that have been specifically bred for forage yield, um, which is what I'm going to talk about for a little bit here this, or this afternoon. Um, and those forage varieties also have some opportunities for grazing. I mentioned this minimized ergot risk a minute ago, and that's because the breeders at KWS have developed what they call the Pollen Plus technology. And so basically your only defense against ergot is, is increased pollen and decreasing pollination time. And so these hybrids have been bred to produce almost five times more pollen than a conventional variety of rye, and flowering can happen as little as an eight hour window. So when you make flowering very uniform and you create more pollen, that's your only defense against ergot. And so that's the technology that all of these hybrids have. Um, we can talk about profit potential when we have another high yielding cereal crop that can be introduced into the rotation. Um, what's the value of having 100 to 150 bushels to the acre from a small grain? And then we also know that including small grains can improve your rotation, improve your soil health. We still have um, winter ground cover, we're still providing a lot of those values, but we're also talking about diversified production times. Um, being a farmer myself, I'm in a predominantly corn soy rotation, I know the challenge that happens in May when you're rushing to get all your acres planted, and I know the challenge that happens here in just a couple months when you're rushing to get it all harvested. Now we're talking about spreading out some of those harvest acre times into July. Um, and so labor management becomes a little more interesting from that standpoint and how you can justify what this is worth in your rotation. And then we still, like I mentioned, see the benefits of soil health in terms of recycling nutrients. Um, it helps to build the soil. Hybrid rye has an extensive mass of roots so we can re prevent and reduce some erosion and loosen topsoil. And then when we're looking at the forage side, we're talking about a spring or fall feed source that can be on idle acres. So in a forage system, we're not even asking to replace corner beans, we're adding to that system. And so, maybe, I wanna jump right in and start with talking about our hybrid rye varieties for silage. 
Um, so this was actually silage that was harvested this year. I'm going to present some of our 2019 silage data that we've collected. Um, this comes from the USDA research station in Akron, Colorado, and they harvested at two dates, so May 31st and June 10th. So May 31st would basically represent um, ear emergence or very early boot, and then June 10th is flowering. And so if we're removing a crop at May 31st and that ground is still available, we can still turn around and put our corn or beans in after that. So we're not even replacing a crop in the rotation. We're just adding another crop. Um, so these would be our yields from the Wisconsin silage trial. I've adjusted everything here to a 65% moisture. Um, and this on the left hand side on the Y axis is our tons per acre. And then you can see the varieties across the bottom here. So anything that has a KWS and then a fun Italian name is uh, one of our hybrid varieties. Um, and our salad varieties um, are typically denoted with a pro in front of them, so pro power and pro gas. And what separates them, even though they're not always the highest yielding, is they've been bred to be more digestible um, on top of having increased biomass yield. And then the black and gray bars would be triticale or conventional uh, rye, open pollinated rye varieties, but primarily triticale in these uh, experiments here. And you can see that pretty dominantly our KWS hybrids were the higher yielding silage varieties. At the later date, which would be at flowering, we did have one forage triticale that managed to jump up and tie with our uh, KWS Pro Power which is one of our prominent forage varieties and then you can see KWS Pro Gas. These are our two predominant silage varieties have basically jumped to the top um, and this is pretty consistent and then we're talking at just under five tons uh, of silage per acre in these trials. Um, so then we also did another experiment with Colorado State um, and basically this we wanted to figure out how does conventional rye compare to our KWS Pro Gas and KWS Pro Power? And at what point do we really deviate and start to move away from a conventional rye in terms of biomass yield? And so you can see here, starting at April 2nd, there's not a lot of difference in terms of tonnage and biomass yield, but then at April 30th, we really started to deviate in terms of just how much dry forage yield is available. Um, and so I think this is interesting, and I'm going to show another on-farm trial here in a few minutes that really addresses, is there a difference between open pollinated conventional rye and hybrids in terms of silage yield? Um, speaking of some of our on-farm practical trials, when we launched with our silage varieties, Five Rivers, um, which is one of the largest feedlots here in the United States, contacted us and said, we feed a lot of small grain silages. We have it on pivots across Texas, Oklahoma, Colorado. We're interested in trying out some of your hybrids. We've heard good things, we want to try them. So um, they put in two fields in Texas and two fields in Colorado. Um, three of those fields were hybrid rye versus triticale, and one of them was hybrid rye versus wheat. You're going to see some really high yields. Keep in mind these were all on irrigation pivots, um, and they were taken all the way to um, basically very early dough or just past milky stage um, and so you're going to see optimal tonnage maybe they lost a little bit of digestibility but going into feedlot rations they were really concerned about how many tons can we pull off of our acres. Um, I was down there in uh, the end of April just to visit the fields and take a look and see what they looked like. This was in Hartley, Texas and you can see KWS Pro Gas here on the left and winter wheat here on the right. And actually, if you were to get close and look at that winter wheat, they had a very cold, windy frost come through the morning before I was there. And the tops of all of their wheat are actually frost burnt. And the rye, which is known for its winter hardiness, was just fine. Um, across all of the experiments, they averaged 7.5% uh, more yield in their hybrid rye versus either their triticale or their wheat varieties all adjusted to a common moisture. They were very happy with these outputs um, and they were very excited about this and they're continuing to put in, they've doubled the amount of test plots for this next year actually. Um, and then just to give you an idea of what that nutrient profile looks like, uh, this silage will be fed 
Um, moving into this winter, they have that all packed, and then we're going to see some of that performance data, hopefully, from those cattle as well. But just to give you an idea of what it looked like going into the pile, you can see proteins were pretty comparable across the board for the most part. Um, and then nitrates, I sometimes get a question about what hybrid rye looks like for nitrates going into a silage pile. All of these were considered safe to feed um, low enough nitrate levels across all the small grains. So, as I mentioned, uh, really comparing old style open pollinated rye versus our hybrid varieties. Um, this trial comes from our home state of Wisconsin here, so probably a bit more applicable to what uh, you guys would be dealing with in this area. Um, this was a dairy producer that had been growing and chopping open pollinated rye for silage for a couple years now. Um, he's been using it to supplement his dairy rations, and so he had quite a bit of experience with chopping rye. He heard about our hybrids and said, I want to see how it compares to the system that I've been using. So he no-tilled his hybrid rye um, following corn silage. So this would have been September 23rd of last year. And the other thing that's interesting, if you look at our production rye, you'll see that our planting rate for our hybrids is quite low. Um, and that's because it truly has the capacity to tiller. And if we put too many seeds out there, we're actually suppressing some of that ability. Um, and so he had a variety not stated, open pollinated rye that he planted at 100 pounds to the acre and then KWS Pro Gas at 44 pounds to the acre. And this was harvested then uh, late May of this year. So I had the opportunity, I was out there at the end of May visiting this field. Um, and you can see the BNS right here and the KWS Pro Gas here. To me, what's very interesting to point out is how uniform this field is. We're talking about a genetically identical hybrid. Um, all of those plants should be very consistent and very uniform, whether it's a silage variety, a grain variety. Um, and I think this picture really shows that. Um, you can definitely see some differences in terms of height, uniformity, when you're out in an open pollinated field of rye. Um, and even though this field maybe looks a little bit taller than this one, hybrid rye yielded 26% more than the VNS rye averaged across two different uh, plots that he had planted, two different pastures. Um, and so he was very happy and we think this is a substantial amount. And also keep in mind that this was at less than half of the seeding rate and he still saw this improvement in yield. Um, and so this is tons per acre again. You can see he got between about two and a quarter and just under three tons of silage per acre. Um, and he pulled this off in May and then had full intentions of going back in with another crop. Um, so he was never interrupting his typical rotation. He was just supplementing on um, basically creating that winter cover and supplementing on acres that otherwise would have been idle or would have had a cover crop that he would have terminated. Um, so then we also sent some of this stuff to the University of Wisconsin to do some nutritional profile testing. Um, and you can see here we have our forage type, NDF digestibility, crude proteins, and then a milk estimate, which was a calculation uh, that's been created by the University of Wisconsin that estimates pounds of milk that can be produced per acre of silage. Um, and so this is only applicable to within a contemporary group, so we can only compare these silages that were all grown together. You can't take this number and then compare it to a silage that was grown in Iowa two years ago. But within a contemporary group, you can see that um, our hybrid rye, KWS Pro Gas, would produce significantly more pounds of milk per acre of silage produced when you compare to the VNS rye. Again, this silage has been packed and he will be feeding it this fall winter to his dairy cattle. Um, so a little bit on the production of this silage and some things to keep in mind. We recommend either two cutting stages. The first would be flag leaf and the second would be milky stage. Um, flag leaf is going to give you your highest quality silage. Um, this is actually what they were going for it um, with the Wisconsin trial, but Mother Nature this spring did not cooperate, and so they got it out a little bit later than they were planning on. Um, but this would be typically 
a mid to late May time frame, maybe early June. Um, and you're going to get about a 15 to 20 percent crude protein silage at this point. Um, this can be ideal for a double cropping situation because this still gives you some time to get a second crop in after that. Um, milky sage this year came in about late June, depending on where we were, just because we had such a cool wet spring. This was a little bit delayed. And we'll see more of those 8 to 10 percent crude proteins, um, but highest tonnage, highest yield at these points. Um, and this is dates that are adjusted for this area. As you go further south, these dates get shifted. Um, so just keep that in mind as either just kind of a general estimate. Uh, other things to really keep in mind is that if you're cutting early, oftentimes moisture level in these crops are quite high. Um, sometimes we can see, especially with as wet as it was this spring, 85% moisture. That means that you might need to windrow and let that crop dry down some because we really need to see that 65% moisture before you start packing this or you're going to have sludge. Um, other thing to keep in mind, some people often ask why I recommend milky sage or milky ripe sage for a hybrid rye versus early dough where a lot of people would chop oats or winter wheat. And that's because rye will actually start drying down very rapidly and will start losing leaf biomass between those two stages. And so if you're trying to get a silage, there's a lot more high quality, highly digestible uh, forage biomass at this stage than there is at this stage. Um, and so that's why that recommendation is actually shifted a bit earlier with, high, or with rye silages versus other small grains. And when you wait too long, your dry matter can be too high, not enough moisture, and that becomes very difficult to pack. I want to talk a little bit about some grazing work that we've done. Um, Georgia, University of Georgia called us up when they first heard about this crop and said, we graze a lot of winter wheat. Can we try out your hybrids? Um, and so basically how this was done is they planted the hybrid rye, they planted um, some of their other winter cereals and harvested this forage at numerous time points to estimate pounds of production per acre. And so this would have been done from November through April. Remember in Georgia they can get away with that. Um, but you can see that our KWS hybrids uh, substantially out yielded the other varieties that they were using for their winter grazing. And so we decided to take this a little bit further north. So this is at the AAFC in Lacombe, which is actually uh, up in Canada. But we started this trial fall of last year. So this is just preliminary data. We don't have all the results from this yet. Um, we're hopeful to get that here in the next couple months. Um, so last fall, they planted hybrid rye or swath grazed barley. And the cattle that were on the hybrid rye gained 2.2 pounds a day and the swath raised barley cattle actually lost 0.9 pounds per day. <clears throat> Excuse me. And one of the reasons is they ran some initial nutrient evaluations of those forage samples, and rye had about 18 to 30% crude protein, 75 to 80% digestibility, and then the swath raised barley, you can see 12% crude protein and 65% digestible. Um, like I said, yields, um, are still being calculated for these trials. So we're going to have more data upcoming. Just some pictures of what this looked like. So these were those pastures that cattle were going into last fall. And what they looked like. This is actually how far down they were grazed. We actually recommend some pretty intense grazing for the hybrid rye because it has such the capacity to tiller. And those new tillers are what provide uh, the nutrient density in terms of digestibility and crude protein. Um, and then I was back there this spring, and this, these plots, these hadn't had cattle turned out yet. Um, I was there a couple weeks before they were going to turn cattle out. So this is the hybrid rye plots on the left, and on the right is their winter wheat plots that those cattle were grazing. Um, and you can already see the difference in terms of early spring forage availability um, in those plots. One of the reasons, and I always think this is interesting to show, so basically this rye plant was spray painted 24 hours later. We went out and took a picture. Um, and the reason there's just so much biomass from this hybrid is this is just how fast that crop can grow in 24 hours. 
Um, a couple considerations if you're planning on grazing. Um, there is an opportunity for uh, fall forage availability. We've also been doing some work up at Lacombe in terms of what planting date and how early we can put this crop in the ground. Um, and so if you're truly looking, if you have some prevent plant acres and need fall forage, um, really now you can put this crop in the ground even a couple weeks ago and then within four to five weeks you have a forage source available for fall grazing. Um, if you're looking to get a subsequent crop off of it in terms of a silage crop, um, appropriate forage management is important. You do need some growth going into the winter if you want winter survivability. Um, but on the catch, you don't want too much growth. Um, so it's actually a happy medium. If you go into the winter with too much foliage um, and you get a really dense, wet, warm snow on top of it, you set yourself up for disease pressure uh, like snow mold and that can actually result in some winter kill. So it's the happy medium of good forage management. There's also the opportunity for spring grazing. Um, it's the first forage to, for forage to emerge. You were in the talk earlier, that two degrees Celsius where rye starts growing, that's about 37, 38 degrees Fahrenheit. This is the very first crop to start growing in the spring. Also, I will caution you, if you're taking it all the way to a grain yield, I do not recommend spring grazing because your window between enough forage availability and elongation is so short, we're talking a couple weeks at most, that you have an opportunity for grazing, it's really hard to pull cattle off at the right time to not impact your grain yields or to not set you up for ergot risks. Um, and so from that standpoint, if you're looking for a silage yield, you maybe have more flexibility, but keep that in mind. Um, and again, we recommend some more intense grazing measures because the best you can get out of this crop is really those new fresh tillers. And so strip grazing, mob grazing, things like that work really well with this crop. So just a couple conclusions. Um, what we've seen so far, again, this is a very new, very novel crop here in the States, um, but we have seen in terms of our silage varieties, a higher biomass yield than any of our other winter cereals, um, which can mean higher stocking rates, more cattle per acre. Um, it is the earliest spring feeding source just because of that low soil temperature and beginning growth. There's also a possibility for double cropping when we're removing this crop in May. Um, it can add diversity to your rotation. We can have all of those soil benefits that we see um, from cover crops, rice incredibly competitive to weeds. Um, so all of these things are really important to keep in mind. So we're gonna take a little bit of a transition and jump from the forage side to the grain feeding side. Um, if you have questions for me, please hold them till the end. We should have plenty of time for questions. Um, but now I'm gonna turn this over to Miss Molly. So my talk is much more on the nutrition side than Becca's, um, but I'm going to specifically talk about pigs. So uh, just a little outline of my presentation. Um, we'll start by talking about some background and the procedures that we use in our lab to evaluate feedstuffs. Then we're going to talk about the composition of hybrid dye in terms of digestible nutrients, specifically looking at amino acids, phosphorus, sorry, um, starch, fiber, and energy. And then we'll talk a little bit about what we know about pig performance thus far. So just to reiterate, um, hybrid rye is a commodity that can be used um, in the end market of human food as well as distilling and then livestock. And like I said, we're going to focus in this part of the talk just on pigs. So hybrid rye for pigs, I want to open up by um, presenting this quote from Dr. Robert Easter. He's a former president of the University of Illinois. And he stated that the objective of swine nutrition is to provide each nutrient in both quantity and form that will precisely meet the pig's requirements for growth, reproduction, milk production, and, make, and if necessary, maintenance at the least possible cost. So I think that really ties into the goal of the research that I've been conducting for the last two years, where I really want to find out how hybrid rye can fit into a ration for pigs and specifically determine the quantity and the form of the nutrients that it will contribute to a diet. So just to get everybody on the same page, this is just a really brief um, overview of pig uh, nutrition or pig digestion. Um, we obviously start with feed ingestion and then the feed moves down through the esophagus into the stomach. 
Um, in the stomach, this is where a lot of uh, degradation of the feed into smaller particles occurs. And then digestion uh, continues uh, into the small intestine where it's being further broken down. And then towards the latter part of the small intestine is where the bulk of um, absorption occurs. So this is where all amino acids as well as sugars are observed. And so then this little star that I have here represents one um, method that we have of determining the digestibility of a feed. And so we can insert a cannula here and then collect the ileal digesta, and then from that we can determine the ileal digestibility of a feed. And then the second half of the digestive system, um, sometimes called the hindgut or the large intestine, consists of the cecum here where soluble fiber is fermented, and then the colon where essentially everything that's not absorbed in the small intestine is then fermented by microbes. Um, this is primarily where we see the insoluble fiber degradation. And so then our second method of determine, determining the digestibility is to just collect the fecal output, and from that we can determine the total tract digestibility. So a little bit more in-depth um, information about ileal digestibility. This first photo shows um, the type of cannula we use. We just call it a simple tea cannula for obvious reasons. Um, if you can imagine this part of the bottom T um, is inserted into the pig's intestine, and then this part sticks out of the body wall, and then we have these two washers that we can tighten down to keep the cannula in place. And this is done um, by a very simple surgery. I've never done the surgery myself, but I've assisted with it, and it takes about 15 to 20 minutes per pig, so very efficient. And then this is what the cannula looks like right after surgery is complete. You can see an incision here. And then as I talked about, the, um, the threaded portion of the cannula sticks out and then the T part of the cannula would be right here for the pig. This picture down here, if you can see it, is a picture of a pig with a cannula with the cap off. So this pig is ready for collection. And for collection, we just uh, simply attach baby bottle liners to these cannulas, and then we collect um, all of the digesta, constantly switching out those bags for an eight to nine hour period. And then all of that digesta is then put in a pitcher, we, we freeze it immediately, and so then we, this is what we analyze to determine the um, amino acid and the starch digestibility, because we assume that everything that doesn't end up in this pitcher at the end is retained by the pig. And so again, this procedure is specifically used for amino acids and starch. On the other hand, for total tract digestibility, we use um, these metabolism crates. We have um, different sizes for very small pigs up to um, the size for gestating sows. And each of these pigs are housed individually. There's a feeder and then a water line, and then they are situated on top of a series of um, slats screens and pans, and so we can collect um, the total fecal and urine output. So typically how we do that, we feed um, the pigs for a period of adaptation to the diet, typically like five to seven days, and then after that we collect uh, feces and urine for, again, five to seven days depending on the experiment. And this is used um, to determine the digestibility of energy, minerals, and fiber. So in the first experiment um, that we conducted, we determined the digestibility of amino acids. This um, paper is published in the Journal of Animal Science, but I'm going to just give you um, a brief overview of some of our findings. And then just to reiterate the methods that we use, um, if you can picture this, this is a ileal cannulated pig. And then we have a feed ingredient, this is our test ingredient with a known concentration of amino acids. So in this case, um, the rye that we tested had 0.41% lysine. So we can feed that to the pig, collect the digesta, and we determined that the standardized ileal digestibility is 64%, meaning that 64% of that lysine that the pig ingested was actually absorbed and used. So in that case, when we multiply that by the concentration in the grain, we find that the grain actually contains 0.26% standardized ileal digestible lysine. And this is the value that we can use in our feed formulations to ensure that we're um, using additive as well as accurate um, values for our diet formulations. 
So all my graphs are gonna look pretty similar, so if you have any questions um, up front, feel free to ask, because I want you guys to all be on the same page as I move through the presentation. Um, on the x-axis, I have different ingredients that we've tested. So this experiment included hybrid rye, dehulled barley, wheat, and corn. And then on the y-axis, we have um, percentage of lysine in the feed. And so I have these four bars, and the darker shaded portions represent um, the lysine that was digested by the pig, and then the lighter shaded part um, represents the amount that was undigested. And so then therefore, this total bar represents the total concentration of lysine in the grain. So you can see right off the bat, if we just look at the total concentration, the hybrid rye contains the most lysine compared with barley, wheat, and corn. But then when we take digestibility into account, this is the coefficient of digestibility. Hybrid rye had lower digestibility than our three comparison grains. So with that in mind, um, we then can see that the amount of digestible lysine in hybrid rye is then less than barley and wheat, but it's more than in corn. With methionine, same type of graph with the digested portion being darker and then the undigested portion being lighter. Um, the concentration of methionine doesn't differ too much among um, cereal grains. And for this one, we also saw significant um, increases in digestibility for barley, wheat, and corn compared with rye. Uh, but nevertheless, the concentration of digestible methionine and hybrid rye is not different from corn. 3D, similar story. We see very similar total amounts of lysine in rye, barley, and wheat. But then when we take digestibility into account, hybrid rye has lower digestibility, and therefore the concentration of digestible 3E is much closer to corn. Last um, amino acid I'll show, but keep in mind that these trends um, were the same for all indispensable amino acids that we tested. Um, Hybrid rye digestibility of tryptophan was significantly lower than barley, wheat, and corn. And so then therefore, the amount of digestible tryptophan was less than in barley and wheat, but in this case, slightly more than corn. So from experiment one, we concluded that the amino acid digestibility of hybrid rye um, is less than other grains. Um, we attribute this to anti-nutritional factors of hybrid rye. Um, the insoluble fiber has the ability to entrap protein and reduce the digestibility. However, despite the fact that it's less digestible, it's important to note that the quantities of digestible amino acids um, in hybrid rye are very similar to corn, and the amount of digestible lysine is actually still higher than corn. So this is really important, especially in the United States, where corn is our predominant cereal grain in our diets. And so that means that we can replace corn and rye um, and still use similar diet formulations without affecting our digestible amino acid content too much. In experiment two, we determined the digestibility of phosphorus. Um, this paper is published in Translational Animal Science, which is actually open access to anyone. So that can be searched by anyone. Um, and the methods for this one, like I said earlier, we used uh, metabolism crates. So we have a pig here on a slab of floors. We have a feed ingredient with a known concentration of phosphorus. Feed that feed to the pig, collect the feces, and we're able to determine that the standardized total tract digestibility of phosphorus is 49%. So about half of the phosphorus that the pig ingested um, was actually digested, absorbed, and used. And so in that case, when we multiply um, the concentration of phosphorus by the digestible, digestibility value, we find that the ingredient actually contains 0.14% standardized total tract digestible phosphorus. But then another natural question is what happens if we add phytase to the diet? So we did that as well. We add phytase to the same ingredient, feed it to the pig, this time when we calculate digestibility instead of 49%, we um, got 63%. So it was a significant increase. Um, so just keep this in mind. This is just a little schematic of our um, methods that we used. And so, um, yeah, with the 63%, we went from 0.14% digestible phosphorus to 0.18% digestible phosphorus. So in this graph, we've got um, rye, barley, wheat, corn, and sorghum. 
And again, the uh, shaded region down here represents digested phosphorus, and then this is all of the undigested phosphorus. Um, you can see here that the uh, digestibility of phosphorus in rye is actually greater than in the other grains, so not the same story whatsoever as um, amino acids. And on top of that, um, the amount of digestible phosphorus in rye is greater um, than all of these other grains. Then when we add phytase, so I'm going to present um, the phytase data as well for all these grains. We um, increased from 49% digestibility to 63%, as I showed in the previous slide. And then we see significant increases for all other grains as well, for barley, wheat, corn, and sorghum. And so um, I also think it's interesting to point out that although this was a significant difference, it's pretty modest. Whereas we, if we compare it to uh, corn and sorghum, for example, the jumps here that you get when you add microbial phytase are much, much larger than when you um, compare it with rye. And so um, when we consider the amount of digestible phosphorus when we're feeding microbial phytase, um, about equal with uh, barley, slightly less than wheat, but still more than corn and sorghum. And so one of the reasons that the um, digestibility of phosphorus uh, was so high in rye to begin with is because it has um, extremely high amounts of intrinsic phytase. So this is just phytase that is naturally expressed by the plant. And when we analyzed three different hybrids, we had um, up to 3,200 phytase units. Um, and then if you compare that, that is magnitudes more than what we observed in barley and wheat, which had about 500. And then corn and sorghum were practically devoid. So that's why that digestibility in corn and sorghum to start off was so low. So from experiment two, um, again, hybrid rye contains large amounts of intrinsic phytase. And therefore, um, the phosphorus digestibility in rye was really high to begin with. When we added the microbial phytase to the diets, it increased the phosphorus digestibility in all of the grains. Um, however, in rye, the increase was significant, but it was uh, much less pronounced than the other grains. And then this is a really important point to remember. Um, because the concentration of digestible phosphorus in hybrid rye is greater than in corn and a few of the other grains, um, we can conclude that less inorganic phosphorus um, will, need, will need to be added to the diets therefore making the diet cheaper, and less phosphorus can also be excreted in the feces, which is a very good thing. In our third digestibility experiment, we um, determined the digestibility of carbohydrates and energy. So here is our rye again with known concentrations of gross energy, 3,800 kcal per kilogram, 56% starch, 18% dietary fiber. Feed that to the pig. This time we had cannulated pigs, so we could determine the apparent ileal digestibility, and they were in metabolism crates, so we also could determine the apparent total tract digestibility, and then we also collected urine, which enables us to calculate metabolizable energy. So once all of the uh, analysis for this experiment um, are complete, we're gonna have a really great picture of the entire uh, digestibility of carbohydrates and energy. I'll show you what we know so far, though. Um, for starch, you can see that the total amount of starch in cereal grains is pretty constant, around 50 to 60 percent. Um, sorghum is always known to have a bit more starch. Here it's around 63 percent, I believe. And then on top of that, the digestibility of starch is very efficient in monogastric animals. You can see it's above 90 percent in all of these grains. Um, there was one significant difference where this source of wheat um, had a greater starch digestibility than one of the sources of rye, um, but that was not true for the second source of rye. Looking at total dietary fiber, this is one of the really unique characteristics of rye. Um, it has um, dietary fiber that can modulate the gut health, and it's also really fermentable, so it can, uh, it can you know, produce energy for the pig. Um, so when we look at the fermentability here, or the digestibility, um, rye had significantly uh, higher digestibility of fiber compared with barley, wheat, corn, and sorghum, and also um, a greater amount of digestible fiber here. You can see that the um, digestible fiber in rye and barley are very close. However, barley has a lot more undigested fiber, so that's more fecal mass, um, more challenges with manure handling compared with rye. 
with metabolizable energy, which is primarily determined by um, the starch content, because that's the most efficient energy source um, in cereal grains, um, but also influenced by fiber and protein. We uh, found that rye has about 3,500 kilocalories per kilogram on a dry matter basis, which is more than in barley, but less than in wheat and corn. And then there's no difference between uh, sorghum and rye. So from experiment three, starch digestibility greater than 90% in all grains. Um, this is very important because again, starch is the most efficient energy source for cereals. Um, we also noted that the rye digestibility may differ among sources. Fermentation of fiber, we learned, is more efficient in rye than in other grains. And this is important because um, the fermentation of fiber can contribute energy to the pig and also may uh, influence gut health in a positive way. And then lastly, the metabolizable energy in hyperdry is not different from sorghum and it is greater than barley. Um, but we still need to recognize that it is less than corn and wheat. But that's expected because corn and wheat have more digestible starch. Experiment four is the first um, portion of my PhD work um, where we've used the digestibility values calculated in the first um, three experiments to formulate diets. And so what we've done in this experiment is test the performance of sows fed different grade levels of hybrid rye. So we um, hypothesized that by modulating the nutrition of the sows, we will modulate the health as well as the growth of their piglets. And so some of the different ways that we hypothesize the hybrid rye may be influencing um, the pigs is through immune function, satiety, stress, um, indications of digestive function, as well as milk production. And so for this experiment, we start with um, our control diet based primarily on corn, soybean meal, and soybean hulls. And then we replace 25% of the corn with hybrid rye in the second diet. In the third diet, we replace 50% um, of corn with hybrid rye, and then all the way up to 75%. We didn't go up to 100%, but we're kind of kicking ourselves because now we're curious what would have happened. Um, but nevertheless, we started with around 200 sows. We bred them um, on day zero, and then on day seven, we weighed them, a lot of them. At day 90, so they were fed these diets um, all through gestation. At day 90, we bumped feed. Day 105, um, we weighed them again, moved them to lactation, and then took a blood sample. We're planning on analyzing these data for different um, markers for immune uh, function and immune response. At day around 115, um, within 24 hours of farrowing, we weigh all of the piglets as well as the sows and collect um, colostrum samples. We'll be analyzing those for other immune markers as well as composition. Mid-lactation, around day 13, another serum sample is obtained, as well as milk. And then day 21, we wean the piglets, weigh all the piglets, weigh the sows, and take a serum sample from the piglets. So I'm going to move through this data very quick because it's very straightforward. But in gestation, what we observed, initial body weight, no difference. That's expected. It means I allotted the pigs correctly. Day 105, no difference. So they were fed the rye all through gestation, and at the end, no difference in body weight. Sow average daily gain, absolutely no difference. Sow average daily feed intake, no difference. So we can sum that up pretty quickly. In gestation, going up to 52.5%, we saw absolutely no statistical differences at this point. And again, this is semi-preliminary data, but it's pretty... <laughs> pretty reliable at this point. Um, so yeah, 52 and a half percent appears to have little to no effect. And we um, believe that if you have clean rye, in which we did, um, it was uh, cleaned at the mill, and no ergot is present, we predict that you could go up to 70% inclusion in gestation diets. With the lactation data at Fairway, we weighed the sows. There is no difference among treatment groups. At weaning, the sow weights, again, no difference. So they um, equally maintain their body condition um, among treatment groups. For average daily gain of the sows, which is really average daily loss because they're mobilizing body reserves, um, producing milk, we saw no differences here among treatment groups. And there is also no differences in average daily feed intake. 
Um, looking at the piglets, so these are um, counts of piglets. So these are the total number of pigs born, no difference. Live born, no difference. Number of weaned pigs, no difference. But this is really interesting and important, I think. Um, for mortality, we saw a linear and a quadratic reduction in mortality as we added hyperdrive to the diet. So not that we were surprised that this happened, but we're very pleased that this did happen. Um, a little bit more in depth about the mortality data, we looked at the number of pigs um, killed by crushing or being laid on. We had a tendency for a linear reduction as um, rye was being added to the diet, so it's hypothesized that perhaps the sows were calmer, they weren't getting up and laying down as much, and weren't crushing as many pigs. We don't know that for sure, that's just our hypothesis. Um, there was no difference in the number of uh, low vitality pigs, though. Um, continuing on with the piglet data, there was a linear reduction as hybrid rye um, was added to the diet for uh, the total litter birth weight to be reduced. However, there is no difference in the um, live litter weight. This is birth weight. Litter wean weights, there was a quadratic effect. So this means, if you picture a quadratic effect kind of like a parabola, this means that the control diet and the high rye diet had um, pretty much equal responses, whereas this uh, low rye and mid rye were actually uh, increased compared to the control. Litter average, th average daily gain, same thing, where you see we actually saw that the low rye and the mid rye um, diets actually perform better than our control and our high rye. For average live weight, this is uh, average piglet data, no difference. Average wean weight, no difference as well. Average pig, average daily gain, no difference. And then estimated milk production per day, this is just a function of litter weight gain. Um, we saw a quadratic uh, response where our middle um, treatments with rye produced um, slightly more milk than our control and our high rye diets. So to sum up the results that we've seen so far in these data, um, there was a linear reduction, if you remember, it kind of went like this, in total litter weight, but that was not true for live litter weight, so you can take that for what it's worth. Um, what I think is really interesting, we did see a reduction in mortality with the rye diets, and then the quadratic responses that we saw with those middle treatments um, where they were elevated, that was true for litter wean weight, litter average daily gain, and estimated milk production. So to sum that up, um, essentially adding hybrid rye to lactation diets uh, did not result in any reduction in sow or piglet performance, and it actually reduced mortality. So then um, as I continue with my PhD upcoming research, I'm gonna be conducting an experiment where we're gonna be testing the preference of taste. So a lot of farmers ask, well, will my pigs eat it? So far on all of my experiments, the pigs like it just fine. They do eat it, but we're gonna conduct an experiment where we'll have scientific data to say whether they prefer corn or um, rye. And then we're gonna be doing a experiment where we're comparing the energy utilization and growing finishing pigs and sows. And we hypothesize that since uh, finishing pigs and sows have greater uh, capacity for fiber fermentation, perhaps they're more efficient at using the hybrid rye. And then we're gonna be doing a series of growth performance studies as well, where we'll do the standard um, you know, feeding, weighing them, but then we're also gonna be going more in depth by looking at immune modulation, um, as well as fecal scores. And then on the other side of that, we're gonna be looking at the carcass characteristics of pig's fed rye, as well as a consumer taste panel for the meat of pig's fed rye. And so that's it. Um, again, my name is Vaughn McGee, my email is up here. This is the website for my lab, and I will take any questions with Becca as well. Questions? Margaret. So long if you go back and emphasize that you're showing some quadratic responses to some factors like the piglets. Yep. So Happening. You're seeing improvement with a small amount of rye, and then you get more rye, and 
drops off? What, what do you speculate? I mean, in lactation, when we started this experiment, they said, you can't go over 40% inclusion rate, the pigs are gonna do bad, blah, blah, blah. And we're like, okay, well, we wanna go a little higher than that and see what happens. So we were expecting a drop off just because that fiber can be affecting the sows and lactation, you can have trouble with sow feed intake, stuff like that. Um, essentially, the fact that we saw no difference between the control group and the high rye group, we're very pleased with that. But so what's the increase? The increase? Yeah. I don't know. It could be that the pigs were, you know, calmer, if they were feeling more satiated, more full from eating that fiber, um, if they had better gut health because the fiber within hybrid rye has a lot of fructans, it has a lot of soluble fiber, all those things, you know, promote the microbial populations in the gut. All of those things could have modulated their health. Um, we'll have more information about that once I start analyzing all the blood and milk. So managing this in a, in a farm situation, do you think it's advantageous for if you're gonna finish pigs for some iron that that their mothers have had some iron that? I don't see a reason why okay. there would be a benefit. I don't think there would be any negative effects by any means, but I don't think I don't think you would have to have that stipulation by any means. With the uh, open pollinated ride, was there a, is there a large difference in uh, feed value? and inclusion in the diet because when you look at this you don't want a whole lot of right so as far right. as <laughs> um i'm like very well versed in the digestibility portion so when we compare um hybrid rye to open pollinated rye just based on like old book values because we assume if it's old values it's based on old type rye um, the digestibility of amino acids is lower in these newer ryes um, but I think any like economic loss that you may perceive there would be made up tremendously by the agronomic advantages on the front end. Um, as far as forage type and other agronomic types, you can talk more on that. So I think you're referencing this fun little table here. Um, so most of the rye native, which there is very little of, comes from the mid 90s. Um, and a lot of that rye Typically, we had ergot issues, and most often, I think the limitation for rye feeding was ergot and not actually any of the nutritional parameters of rye. I would agree with that. And the technology one for cleaning rye has gotten so much better. But on top of that, for rye is the amount of a decreased risk for ergot really changes what inclusions can look like. Because yes, if you have ergot invested rye, these are max inclusions. These are accurate. Um, and we know that if a producer that sends me a sample that it's infected for some reason or another, we say, hey, you can still feed this, but now you're looking at these numbers and not those numbers. Um, and so that's why I think some of this data is so hard to tackle because the old data, and oftentimes they don't even present ERGA, they don't present what it might have been pertained with or anything like that. And so that makes interpreting some of the old research very challenging. Um, and then basically we stopped researching rye because at 10% of the diet, it wasn't worth considering. Mm -hmm. um, and so there's just been this huge gap in literature. Um, and that's one of the limitation and why we see these numbers. Are you all catching the, uh, I guess, like, observational behaviors? Like, or things like that, or is that even kind of significant to capture? We haven't done any of that. I don't know if you've done any behavior studies with other groups. So, um, Denise's group at University of Saskatchewan is doing a trial right now um, with crawl finish pigs, and they are actually um, they have rye and corn based diets, and they're actually mixing, getting ready to mix those finishers to assess aggression and tail biting and biting. Um, and so we will have data on that because anecdotally that's one of the things that producers have mentioned in terms of the behavior, calmness, satiety, is that 
that they're getting to see the less aggressive on rye diets. Um, so we're working very hard to get actual scientific values to attach to that. Um, and so we, we should have that data early next year. Anecdotally as well with these sows, um, the farm manager, I've been working on this trial since last October, and the first few groups that we were moving to the farrowing house, he was like, what do you have in these diets? Like, these pigs are so, like, they look like they're just going to fall asleep while you're moving them on the tractor. And I was like, I don't know, like, KWS hypothesizes that it does calm them down. He's like, well, I think it's working, but obviously we didn't test anything like that, but they do seem just very kind of lackadaisical and... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. 